After our series on the Sherman Brothers earlier this year, a series that mostly focused on their work in film, I wanted to go back and explore their work on at least one of the attractions for the World's Fair. In this series, we're mainly looking at It's a Small World, but today we will also talk about the Carousel of Progress as well. We've talked about Small World many years ago, but this time I want to bring in more of the cultural context for the ride, specifically what it meant for the World's Fair and how it was in dialogue with the culture of the 1960s. In the first part last week, we looked at the groundbreaking ceremony for the World's Fair as well as the early Disney efforts to create attractions. Long after Disney had started work on the Carousel of Progress and the Magic Skyway, the Pepsi-Cola company asked Disney to build an attraction that would benefit UNICEF. Walt envisioned a boat ride called Children of the World, in which small dolls would sing their national anthems. Walt looked to Mary Blair, currently a darling of the New York advertising agencies, to design the children. He looked to Rolly Crump to design a massive tinker toy-like mobile rising over a hundred feet to be positioned in front of the show building, one that would function as a visual marquee. And by early spring, the WED team was moving quickly to create the attraction. For Walt, one of the largest questions concerned audience. For the previous eight years, he had seen Disneyland grow in terms of popularity. But its audience was primarily from the West Coast. Walt was aware that the cultural touchstones for the West Coast, based largely in film and TV, were different than those for the East Coast. New York and New England, he knew, had deeper roots in the theater and art galleries. Walt was anxious to see if his style of themed attractions would also prove successful with a culturally sophisticated New York audience. At the WED facility in Glendale, California, a few miles from the Disney studio, Mary Blair's concepts for the international children were being developed into figure sketches showing movement. Figure sketches once approved were handed off to Disney sculptor Blaine Gibson and figure finisher Harriet Burns, who translated them into three-dimensional creations. As Harriet Burns recalled, quote, we worked out the babies with Mary Blair. She was a two-dimensional person, so Blaine had to make them three-dimensional and try to get as much character as the original into a three-dimensional head. All the babies had to have a neutral gendered head that could be boy or girl, depending on wig and paint and costume. And we had to have every nationality just by pigment with the same head. Blaine Gibson had a slightly different take on the experience. Quote, it was sort of difficult for me to try and develop the three-dimensional character designs to fit her two-dimensional style, but ultimately I think we were able to get the feeling of it. In other words, Gibson struggled to translate Mary Blair's concepts, which were decorative in nature and featured elements not arranged for movement, into usable dimensional models that still retained the feel of Blair's flat watercolors. Initially, he made three prototypes for the standard head, then asked Walt to pick the best one. The finished dolls, according to Harriet Burns, would be little more than a, quote, jelly bean body and little arms and legs. Because of their bouncy, rhythmic movement, the dolls soon would be known around WED as rubberheads. As the rubber heads were being fabricated, Walt understood that he needed to hire additional designers to finish the ride. One of the people he looked to was Mark Davis's wife, who had relatively little experience with studio assignments, though she did have formal training as a costume designer. Quote, Walt Disney's secretary called me on the phone and asked if I would like to do the costumes for Small World, Davis explained. And I said, would I? So she said, be here at nine tomorrow morning. The following day, Alice Davis learned more about the project. Mary Blair had done the colors for the costumes, but Davis would do the research, 
the pencil sketches, and prepare the materials for the costumes themselves. But even Davis, who was relatively new to the studio, recalled that the project stretched the work capacity of the WED team. Quote, the ride was a difficult one, she recalled, because we had exactly one year to design it, make the costumes, the figures, choose the color patterns, do the sets, then put it all together on the number one soundstage at the studio, tear it all down, ship it to New York, get to New York, and put it all together. The costumes, along with the wigs, facial makeup, and skin pigment were essential to the ride, especially as the children shared the same body construction. Mary Blair and Alice Davis together selected recognizable traditional costumes to define each region. Indian boys wore turbans. Dutch children were fitted with wooden clogs. Though much of the costuming was handmade, the Disney team also looked to acquire authentic elements to complete design. For example, they visited Oliveira Street in Los Angeles for sombreros and shops in Little Tokyo for plastic fish and paper balloons. They used traditional silk for the production of Indian saris and wool for the bagpiper's kilt. The costumes suggested that even though the international hopes and longings of children remained the same from continent to continent, that difference in their identities was achieved through a connection to the past, even if that difference was presented through iconic cultural costumes rather than the actual everyday clothes children wore in those regions. Quote, there were two types of figures in the ride, Rolly Crump recalled, the realistic-looking figures which Blaine Gibson sculpted and the toy-like figures such as the Little Wooden Soldiers which Jack Fergus and I were building. Some of these toy figures were sculpted out of styrofoam blocks, others were created with a process similar to paper mache. But Crump also wanted his work on the toy figures to stylistically match the work that Blair and Gibson had accomplished on the doll figures. Quote, Jack and I knew that Mary had illustrated a series of golden books for children, Crump explained. So we went out and bought a bunch of those books to analyze her style. We wanted to build the toys as if they had been designed by her, and we wanted to remain faithful to her style. Together, they observed the elements in Blair's children's books and tried to replicate that in their toys. Inspiration for individual toys came from many sources, from actual toys, from photos, from drawings, and even from Walt himself. Quote, Walt had just returned from a trip to Europe, Roly Crump recalled, when he walked into the office and handed me a box. Happy birthday, Roly, he said. It wasn't my birthday. Inside was a toy figurine riding a bicycle across a length of wire. Walt wanted Roly and Jack Fergus to make a larger toy figure to use in the ride with the wire passing directly over the boats. The rubber head dolls were wired up for a relatively new sound movement synchronization process that Disney termed audio animatronics. In essence, Disney programmed movement and music on a single one-inch magnetic tape, which had 32 separate channels. Some channels delivered sound to various sections of the ride, while others delivered impulses that drove the air cylinders to manipulate the figures on stage. Dolls representing children with a range of skin tones were being developed in Glendale so they could stand side by side on show stages as boats floated by, presenting a type of peaceful equality that America struggled to find in the 1960s. Even the World's Fair Corporation itself in New York had been criticized for a lack of diversity in the people they hired. Two years earlier, the Urban League of Greater New York charged that Robert Moses, president of the fair, and his team had not hired enough African-American workers, particularly supervisors and managers. Dr. Edward Lewis, representing the League, said that, quote, the fair's aim of world peace through understanding would ring hollow unless changes were made. This critique, when picked up by the New York Times, did bring a slightly higher degree of racial diversity to the World's Fair Corporation, but nowhere near the diversity in the neighborhoods surrounding the fairgrounds itself. The Disney ride at this point would serve largely as an aspirational dream a reminder of how all people are connected and share basic goals. 
But the critique of the World's Fair Corporation, along with the growing voice of the civil rights movement, would bring change later elsewhere at the fair. By the summer of 1963, the WED design team was struggling to finish the attraction. To save time, the set structures were produced by an outside firm, Grosh Studios, that often did work for film production companies. To finish the sets, Roly Crump and Jack Fergus bought 195 pounds of glitter, over 8,000 costume jewels, 730 yards of braiding, and 336 tassels. Each week, they went through five pounds of glue, finalizing the stages. One of the toy fabricators, Joyce Carlson, recalled that the anxieties over the deadline sometimes entered their workshop space. Quote, in the European scene, Rowley designed the chess people. Mary asked me to put jewels on the king and queen. Mark said not to put them on. I was caught in the middle. Apparently, they had a loud discussion about it. Mary came to me and apologized for me being put in the middle. Then she said, put the jewels on. I listened to Mary and didn't hear anything else. Rolly Crump understood that this ride, perhaps more than any other Disney attraction, was the conscious projection of one artist's style. Mary Blair had designed the iconic rubberhead dolls, though Rolly and Jack Fergus had designed the toy figures, they had modeled their work on paintings previously created by Mary Blair for a series of children's books. Crump was also aware of Walt's deep affection for Blair's work. Because of this, Rolly thought that the ride in some way should offer a tribute to Mary Blair as a designer. The idea of a tribute inside of a ride to an artist, to a person other than Walt, was new. In terms of time, this was an extravagance, as they were now pushed up against a wall of deadlines. But Rolly Crump made sure that one of the dolls arranged into the ride resembled Mary Blair. Quote, We were living off of black coffee in the morning, Crump said, and martinis for lunch. Mary Blair and I were kind of kidding that if it hadn't been for Jen, we never would have opened Small World on time. The boats and the flume system were created by another outside firm, Aero Development, a ride design company with whom Disney had partnered on many previous projects. They were focused on producing a high throughput system with boats large enough to handle the capacity of a busy World's Fair. But with this, Walt had one more problem. Unlike a typical Disney design, in which the ride and the show building were co-designed to meet the needs of a specific attraction, due to time constraints, the building was designed long before the Disney team had any working plans for the attraction. To solve this problem, he brought background painter and wed designer Claude Coates onto the project. Specifically, Coates's job was to create a watercourse inside of a pre-existing L-shaped building. Coates would also find a way to arrange the show sets still being created around the watercourse he would make. As show stages were created, lights and gels were arranged using a color scheme designed by Mary Blair, which featured bright, playful colors, many close to primary tones. For Blair, painting was as much about color as it was about subject matter. In her work for this ride, mood and emotion was often delivered in large part through a bold color palette and through facial expressions of her children, particularly the presentation of the eyes. Walt once said that Mary was about to find, quote, colors he had never heard of before. Color in the finished ride, partially created through robust theatrical lights, would unify the sets much like washes and strong color selection unified her paintings. The initial mock-ups for this ride were not done at the studio, as had been the case for other attractions destined for the fair. The studio scheduled out space on its sound stages by months, if not a year in advance. Other attractions, because of their long timeline, had been scheduled into the stages around film production. But with its late start date, all stages at the Disney studio during the summer of 1963 were being used to film Mary Poppins. As such, 
An early mock-up for this attraction was arranged in Glendale, a mock-up that even then revealed a central problem in the ride's design. The original plan featured children in each of the showrooms singing their own national anthem, a collection of a dozen songs stitched together from stage to stage. Once the sound was turned on, however, it became apparent that the soundtrack would not work. The serpentine ride course, even with separating walls, wouldn't effectively isolate the different anthems. To solve this problem, Walt realized that he needed to reconsider how music was used on the attraction. He looked to studio songwriters Richard and Robert Sherman, better known as the Sherman Brothers. By this point, the Sherman Brothers had already worked on another World's Fair attraction, the General Electric Carousel of Progress, which was a stage show showcasing how modern life progressed through the 20th century with a focus on new electronic conveniences. Unlike a song written for a movie or TV show, Walt gave the Shermans a specific set of instructions for the song they were to create for the carousel. First, the song needed to be adapted into a number of styles so that each stage absorbed the musical flavors of a unique era. The song would need to be presented with a 1920s ragtime, then with the brassy exuberance of a 1940s swing, finishing off with the modern or near-future tones of the 1960s. Specifically, they were asked that the final section be arranged in the style of Annunzio Mantovani, a composer who fused the sounds of light popular music with a symphony orchestra. His work was best known for cascading strings and early electronic elements that hinted of the future. Beyond the style requirements, Walt explained that the brothers needed to time this song perfectly right down to the second, so that from the start of the song to its end, it would allow for the transition of one stage scene to the next. Lastly, the different styles of the song needed to harmonize as while the stage was shifting, music could bleed from one audience area to the next before the stage walls again were aligned, creating soundproof compartments around each seating area. For the carousel, they explored ideas that would speak to the general concept behind GE products without letting the song sound like a commercial. This would be a difficult task, as it required them to find lyrics that gestured to the products without naming them. They eventually wrote, There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, a song that ultimately wasn't just about GE products, but also was about Walt Disney, the way that he optimistically looked at the future. The song worked perfectly as a theme song for the carousel, touching on ideas important to General Electric and satisfying all of the elements required for an animatronic stage show in which stage scenes transitioned as the audience watched. The underlying problem for the Children of the World ride was surprisingly similar to one of the musical challenges for the Carousel of Progress. In the carousel, Walt needed versions of the song to harmonize because the sound bled between audience areas. In the Children of the World ride, there had been minimal attempt to manage sound bleed and the different national anthems in transition areas created a type of musical chaos, suggesting more a difference in cultures rather than musical harmony, which was the ride's theme. The issue came to light in the summer of 1963. Quote, Walt drove Dick and me down to WED, Bob Sherman explained. There were hundreds of ethnocentric audio-animatronic puppets set up on both sides of a serpentine corridor. As we walked slowly through the snake-like walkway, numerous recordings of vocals were emitted from each section of the ride. The sections were divvied up by country with each group of audio-animatronic children singing its own national anthem. Dick Sherman added, quote, on paper, it sounded great. The mock-up wasn't of the entire ride. Maybe it was close to half, but it was enough to demonstrate the underlying issue. The musical environments blended together. Quote, you couldn't tell what the hell they were singing, Bob explained. It was a cacophony. 
To this, Walt responded, that's my problem. Walt, clearly frustrated, then explained that he was hoping the brothers might fix the problem by writing a song that could be sung in rounds with the lyrics translated into different languages. That is, he needed a song in which the melody remained the same from stage to stage, even if the language shifted. Quote, we need it fast, Walt said. Come up with something that talks about world understanding, but don't make it preachy. The Shermans had grown up in New York with their father writing songs for a range of singers through the music publishers on Tin Pan Alley. They'd also watched Broadway move from folly shows focused on the spectacle of musical acts to more sophisticated book musicals in which music developed characters and framed a narrative. Dick, in particular, was interested in the world of Rogers and Hart, Cole Porter, and the Gershwins. Throughout their childhood, then, both through the example of their father and the musical world of Broadway, the Shermans understood how to write songs that expressed ideas and appealed to New York traditions, particularly those associated with narrative musicals. This sensibility was central to their work on film, such as with Mary Poppins, but would also be useful for an attraction at the World's Fair, which used music to convey ideas through a unique type of stage show. For the children's boat ride, they worked on a set of songs, perhaps three, maybe four, from which Walt would choose the one he wanted. But initially, they could only think of one song. Quote, we wrote that song so fast, they said. We thought it was too simple to play for Walt. Then we worked two weeks trying to think up something better. The brothers discussed the goals for the ride and eventually came up with three songs that might fit Walt's requirements. By this point, after working on The Carousel of Progress and The Enchanted Tiki Room, they knew that Walt liked music for attractions to quickly set the mood and announce its themes, with the lyrics more direct than for songs used in a movie. They also knew that the song would need to satisfy two audiences, adults and and children. Quote, we never write kiddie songs, Dick said. There's a kid in every adult. The adult enjoys our music on one level, while the kids will hear it on quite another level. After two weeks, Walt called them up. Oh, where's my song, he said. Dick told them, we have three, but we like the first one. The first was tentatively titled, It's a Small World. It had a simple verse and chorus, somewhat like a folk song that could be repeated from stage to stage. In their office, as they played it for Walt, the tempo was thoughtful and leisurely. Yeah, that sounds like it, Walt said. We'll play it for the boys at WED. By this point, as the Sherman brothers understood that the attraction was to benefit UNICEF, they decided to tell Walt that they would donate their royalties to UNICEF as well. The following day, Walt drove the Sherman brothers down to the Wed Complex in Glendale, where they played it for the men and women who were finishing the ride. On the way back, the brothers explained their intentions to Walt. Walt stopped the car and looked at them, as though they didn't understand what this song might mean to their futures. In that moment, the brothers could see that Walt was thinking about what he might do with this ride and this song after the fair closed in two years. Walt told them that they would do no such thing, that the royalties from this song might send their kids to college. Though the original tempo for the song was relaxed, gesturing more to a ballad than a march, by the time the Shermans recorded the first demo, the song was decidedly upbeat. The demo featured Dick Sherman and ex-Mouseketeer Ginny Tyler, who in her post-Mickey Mouse Club days turned out to be a studio regular, contributing voice work to many Disney projects. The demo was bouncy, bright, two vocals accompanied by a piano and some light brushwork on a snare. But the song once finished by the Sherman Brothers would need to take on the musical flavors of the various countries and regions presented in the ride. To arrange out the song for the ride's score, Disney brought in jazz pianist Bobby Hammack. Hammack had recently worked with the Sherman Brothers by orchestrating their songs for the soundtrack of the 1963 Disney film Summer Magic. He had also worked on a number of internationally themed albums, such as a selection of Latin 
Latin tunes for an album with Henry Mancini and a grouping of South Pacific melodies for his own quartet. Under his direction, the Sherman Brothers song was voiced in such a way as to radiate the style of international traditions. The Japanese section, for example, absorbed the tonalities and phrasing of Japanese music, in part by relying on pentatonic scales and in part by adapting the melody for the stringed koto. The Scottish section was arranged for bagpipes, the Mexican section for a mariachi band, and so on. Hammock also orchestrated an overture based on the song incorporating musical styles from around the world. This overture would be played in the ride's courtyard as guests slowly approached the boats, much like an instrumental number at the start of a Broadway show. The music in each showroom would be at the same tempo, arranged into 48-second cycles. The final ride, once assembled in New York, would need 29 different versions of the Sherman song. Some of these tracks were recorded overseas by children fluent in the required languages. TV performers recorded it in Mexico City. A school chorus recorded it in Rome. And a group simply comprised of children recorded it in Tokyo. But some regions were represented in the ride only by music without lyrics. With this, the song's title also became the name for the ride. In press materials beginning in August 1963, the ride was referred to as It's a Small World. As production work finished on Mary Poppins, stage work for Small World shifted from Glendale over to the studio, with other attractions already signed off and ready or near ready to ship to New York. Quote, we actually built the sets for Small World on the stage at the Disney studio, Marty Scalar explained. They were built on a wooden buck. They put the boat on top of it so that you were eye level with the way you would see it on the ride, and they pushed that through the route so you could see what the show was going to look like. With this, Walt riding on a makeshift boat atop wheels was pushed by the show stages, making sure that everything, considering the time limitations, looked as good as possible. While designers finished the attraction, Walt debuted a model of the Small World Complex at a luncheon hosted by Robert Moses, president of the World's Fair. Walt was joined by Herbert Barnett, president of Pepsi, and Halinka Pantaleone, president of the United States Committee for UNICEF. The model made the attraction appear finished, but the ride itself was nowhere near done. During the final months of 1963, designers worked to finish the attraction, synchronizing animation, developing a speaker arrangement to create a unified soundtrack for multi-part audio. The speakers would be carefully positioned on the sets to create a type of musical soundscape. As boats approached the South American section, the sounds of a Peruvian flute would enter the melody. And as boats moved away from that South American section, the Peruvian flute would fade. Months before the fair opened, likely from endless conversations with American companies and the World's Fair Corporation, Walt's interest in other East Coast opportunities for his attractions was on the rise. Among those possibilities was a tower installation next to Niagara Falls, where, if things worked out, Disney might create a Circle Vision film on the culture and history of Canada. Walt made multiple trips to Canada, often in conjunction with trips to the World's Fair site. But on the way home from one of these, in November 1963, the Disney team saw the fabric of America begin to change once again. Quote, We'd been up to Canada, Disney Vice President Card Walker explained. We looked into Niagara Falls. We looked into a big development on the Canadian side. Again, the weather problem. How miserable and cold it can be in the winter, and it's maybe a one-season operation. On that trip, I think we flew up there and then flew down to Florida and then flew all the way down the coast of Florida and across the Everglades. We landed in New Orleans. We were riding in our cars. I was in one car. Walt was in a car behind us. 
and we saw people in their cars being disturbed, and we couldn't figure out what in the hell it was. We finally turned on our radio, and we pieced together that Kennedy had been shot in Dallas. When we got to the hotel in New Orleans, Walt came in behind, and I walked over and told him, We just heard, Walt, that the president has been shot. He was shocked. Though the assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, wasn't tied to causes that were either for or against the civil rights movement, many people at the time assumed the assassination was related to the president's desire for change. During the previous year, the Kennedy administration had worked to develop bipartisan support for civil rights legislation, which would, among other things, outlaw racial discrimination in hiring, voting, and general business practices. Without Kennedy, though, the Civil Rights Act would not pass before the opening of the World's Fair. His assassination would also increase national discussion about civil rights, along with related demonstrations and protests, and would deepen the desire of many for a greater sense of equality protected by federal law. In this environment, the message of that small boat ride, which was centered on human equality, took on an even greater sense of political importance. One of the last design battles for It's a Small World concerned the artistic marquee that would rise 100 feet above the show building, the Tower of the Four Winds. Roly Crump's original model was nimble and whimsical, slender piping supporting an aerial of animal cutouts and propellers. But engineers, contracted through an outside firm, widened out its legs to support the 200,000 pounds of aluminum necessary to finish its construction. They also thickened other elements to protect the tower from wind loads it might experience on the East Coast during hurricane season. In January 1964, Walt Disney and Rolly Crump traveled out to North Main Street in Los Angeles, just north of downtown, where the Xeon Corporation had erected the Finnish Mobile for inspection. It was a massive structure, similar to a building 10 stories tall. To echo the themes of international unity inside the attraction, the finishing team had used a range of colors on the mobile, so the tower had absorbed the colors of every national flag from around the world. Crump believed the tower, now that it was finished, was too thick, that it had lost its sense of play. Walt, however, liked it. Despite Crump's concerns, in early February, the tower was disassembled and placed onto seven chartered trucks for its rather expensive trip out to the New York fairgrounds. Once there, the 110-foot tower was placed atop a circular concessions building, giving it a final height of roughly 120 feet. The attraction and its marquee were assembled in February and March for a projected April 22nd opening. With the enclosed show building, the design team now was able to focus on a final arrangement for stage lighting. The version of the ride that appeared at the fair began with the European stage. For this, Mary Blair drenched the room with a dozen colors, showing unique color values existing side by side. Blues and greens then illuminated Africa. A wave of yellow sheeted down around Asia. The finale was accomplished with a blaze of white and silver. As with the dolls, dolls that were both similar in construction and unique in costume, the light sections suggested a similar dichotomy. Light patterns in each region were unique, but their purity and potency suggested that there was something similar in each region as well. As the show stages were being installed, one Disney employee, John Bowman, said that a number of New Yorkers told him, you'll never open on schedule. But unlike other Disney attractions at the fair that suffered last-minute technical problems, most notably great moments with Mr. Lincoln, It's a Small World was assembled with relative ease. The only early problems the ride experienced were minor, such as when the playback malfunctioned during a test ride a few days before opening. Quote, 
The scenes looked marvelous, the Sherman brothers said, and everything was working fine until we were about a third of the way through the ride when suddenly the sound went off. Then, just as suddenly, it came back on, playing backwards at high speed. The Sherman brothers looked around them and noticed that other people on their boat appeared confused. We were with several of the people who had worked on Small World. Bob was in the boat about two boats ahead of me. I was in the last boat. It was just click, click, clack, the sound of the animatronic dolls. I looked at Bob and I said, okay. We sang the whole thing all the way. It was very memorable to me. We gave a personal performance that first ride. In terms of its theme, it's a Small World remained a departure from most exhibits at the fair. Many exhibits, including others created by Disney, brought the past and the future to life with a stunning degree of technical accuracy. Small World, however, overtly spoke to a unity between nations, a sense of worldwide peace, but more quietly gestured to a sense of compassion and understanding between people who came from different backgrounds, no matter where they lived. In the days leading up to the fair's opening, groups advocating for civil rights looked to the event as a means to politicize their fight for equality. Initially, protesters claimed that they would block roads leading to the fair, but on the morning that the fair opened, they instead disrupted the subway system. On some trains, they blocked doors so those cars could not continue to Flushing Meadows. On others, they pulled the emergency stop cord. In one standoff between protesters and the police, a group of demonstrators chanted, Jim Crow must go, referring to a set of discriminatory laws often focused on racial segregation. The protest overall, though, were smaller than anticipated, leaving most events inside the fair to proceed as planned, including one ride developed by Disney that also advocated for equality and racial tolerance. At 9 a.m. on April 22nd, a rainy Wednesday, It's a Small World opened to an enthusiastic crowd looking to sample Disneyland-style amusements in New York. The first guests were executives from Pepsi, all of them nearing retirement. Retired Rear Admiral Joe Fowler, head of Disneyland Construction, accompanied them on the boats. When they got to the unload station, one executive asked, Admiral, could we possibly have another ride? Fowler looked at them, sitting there like excited children. Of course, gentlemen, he said, we will. But in this moment, Fowler also realized that the ride would find an audience far beyond children who might be interested in the toys and the song. One newsletter, specifically for small world employees at the fair, explained, quote, Our customers are our guests using the philosophy of hospitality familiar to any Disney cast member. But this attraction took that idea one step further. Customers didn't buy tickets from ticket windows. They bought passports from passport windows to board the ride. Within the first month, the attraction was visited by Joan Crawford, Secretary General of the UN, as well as United Nations representatives from the USSR, Canada, Nicaragua, Germany, and India. It was also visited by Jacqueline Kennedy, the president's widow, as one of her first public appearances since the death of her husband the previous year. Even after opening day, the fair attracted protests focused on racial equality, with protesters planning to create counter-exhibits near pavilions hosted by southern states to show elements of prejudice and intolerance that still existed there. But in terms of its hiring practices, the fair itself was more diverse than any previous fair, as many corporations and sponsors had a sense that equality and representation would be important moving forward. Beyond It's a Small World, sponsors of other Disney attractions 
consciously strove for diversity in their pavilion hosts, with an eye toward college students from historically black colleges. The Ford Pavilion, which included many Disney elements, had hired 26 African-American hosts as part of its overall workforce. The General Electric Pavilion had hired 10. In defining its public stance on equality and hiring, a General Electric employee newsletter explained, quote, when you visit General Electric's Progress Land at the New York World's Fair, you will find reassuring evidence that progress for General Electric means human progress no less than technical progress. The extent of these hires was by no means ideal, nor did they correspond to the diversity in neighborhoods that surrounded the fair. But it was a start, an initial move toward a greater equality. It's a Small World, despite its location near the edge of the fair, remained popular all summer, drawing crowds. Near the end of the summer season, Don Kendall, president of Pepsi, explained to the New York Times that the ride had attracted 35 to 40,000 guests a day, putting it, quote, in an attendance class with major free exhibits. He further noted that the pavilion box office accounted for 20% of the total paid admissions at the fair. Admissions would help offset the nearly $8 million that Pepsi had invested in the fair and related advertising campaigns. For Disney, the Small World attraction was a substantial success. By the end of the season, Walt was actively exploring land options in Florida to create an East Coast Disneyland. It's a Small World, along with other Disney attractions at the fair, confirmed his belief that Disney-style amusements would appeal to a sophisticated audience in the Northeast. Perhaps without realizing it, for It's a Small World, Walt had set into motion design elements that would almost perfectly cast the final show for a New York exposition. Mary Blair's character designs turned away from the cute and realistic tones of Disney animation, favoring instead minimalistic presentations than a staple of New York advertising agencies. Likewise, the Sherman Brothers song, turned away from the type of cinematic music that was found in Disneyland and instead drew on recent traditions of the Broadway stage. Through this and through the creativity of the larger wed team, It's a Small World was a perfect match for the New York venue. It was also an ideal venue for Walt's interest in using entertainment to promote values of tolerance and understanding, one that, once the fair was over, would be brought back and expanded for Disneyland in California. In the 1950s, Walt had proposed developing a section of Disneyland into international land. One version of this project had been planned for the space behind Main Street. Another, far larger version had been considered and even laid out for the land right beside the castle going all the way to the back of the park. In this larger version, International Land would take up all of the space later used by the Matterhorn, Submarine Voyage, and the walkways out to the end of the park. International Land would have pavilions representing cultures of various countries with stores, restaurants, and a few rides. International Land was never built at Disneyland. Yet, in the final year of Walt's life, after the World's Fair closed, it's a small world would move to Anaheim, where it would be housed in a new building with a new visual marquee. In the 1950s, international land would have been arranged around cultural tourism, inviting guests to explore regions far from home. In the 1960s, however, with the background of the civil rights movement, It's a Small World had a stronger emphasis on acceptance and unity. The Disneyland version of It's a Small World was a longer ride than the one at the fair, with more show stages, more cultures represented in the second half of the attraction. The entrance to the ride and the show building were built at the very edge of the plot once considered for international land, at the back of the park by the train tracks. It would remain there for decades, its song now offering what the Sherman Brothers called a musical prayer for world peace, 
But that song, and also the ride, echoed one of the central concepts from Walt's later years. That entertainment, perhaps in small ways, could encourage attitudes of understanding and compassion, even during periods of national strife. I'll be back next week with our monthly news and analysis episode. And the week after that, we'll begin our longer summer series. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. Without subscribers, we would simply cease to exist. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. If you enjoy these episodes, please support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens and dozens of extra episodes. But the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. All also leave a link down in the show notes. Until next Sunday, this is Todd James Pierce.